finally making another video after a long hiatus uh, since my last video. I put almost 50 hours in the bike since the last video and I kind of just want to make another one talking about the bike, uh, sort of like a project update uh, where it's at right now. I also need to service the bike and check the valve clearances and throw on a new muffler that I picked up. So I'm just gonna do a walk around of the bike and just talk about a few things first. There's not a ton of stuff I've changed since I built it. I added these frame guards just to protect the powder coating a little bit and you know, give me a bit of grip when I'm uh, squeezing the bike. Uh, you can see my brake pedal is uh, not the uh, Hammerhead Designs one that I installed because the Hammerhead Designs one I installed uh, ran into a log or should I say I ran into a log. I lost my tail light a few rides ago and I need to replace that. I had a bit of an issue where it was spitting out coolant very easily. Like I would be on a single and I'd stop for like a minute and it would just start spewing out coolant. So what I did was pulled the radiator cap that came off the new radiators, the aftermarket radiators that I put in that bike and kind of squeezed it, squeezed this spring, which is the pressure release spring, I guess you could call it. The stock spring in the stock radiator cap is a lot more stiff, so it would hold more pressure. So I put the stock cap on the aftermarket radiators and problem was solved, it doesn't spit coolant out anymore. At the same time I was having the uh, radiator cap issue, I also switched from the green coolant, which you just get at any um, you know auto parts store. I just switched that out to the engine ice stuff, which I thought would solve the problem, but it ended up being the radiator cap, like I just mentioned. Other things I damaged is this uh, Acherby skid plate. There was just a uh, insert washer and bolt that goes into the frame here and that just ripped out. The plastic just wasn't strong enough to hold. Like when I would hit stuff here, it would pull the skid plate back and just rip that, like rip the skid plate straight off that bolt. So what I've done is I've um, bolted this piece of steel that I obviously didn't paint, hence why it's rusty. Uh, kind of sandwiched it on both sides of the skid plate and then put a bigger bolt through. I actually had to tap a bigger hole in the frame um, and that sort of fixed that problem. I also can't really remember what brand fork seals I'd use. I'd have to go back in the video and check. Um, but the fork rebuild itself went well, but these fork seals, uh, I can't remember what brand they were. They, they weren't SKF, which is obviously the best. I didn't use those because they're expensive, but I've learned my lesson because these leak like a sieve. And I think after one or two rides, they started leaking. And then as soon as they started leaking, they let dirt in and it was just all over. They just hemorrhage fork oil. So that's uh, not ideal, but I'm gonna get the suspension tuned for my weight and for more off-road stuff. And hopefully I might even get the air fork converted to a spring fork. I did play around with the clickers uh, initially to try and solve the stiff suspension issue. And I'm gonna be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. So I just kind of made them a little bit softer and sort of see where I went. I couldn't feel much of a difference. So I made them all the way soft. And then this thing was basically unruly on the tracks. It just handled so bad that I just put the clickers right back to stock and sort of just left it. And I think I'll get these tuned by a professional, someone who knows what they're actually doing when it comes to suspension. I've got a really decent dent in the swing arm right here. I don't know if you can see that in the footage but I did that on like a concrete block and riding up on that and across it. And on one of the attempts, I dropped the bike straight on the side of the concrete block and dented the swing arm. You can see this exhaust caps all dented in. I don't remember when I did that. I uh, looped out the bike one time and kind of split the rear fender. If you have a bike that doesn't have electric start, I highly recommend the Recluse. That's just gonna save you a lot of stressful kickstarting and unnecessary fatigue if you don't have an electric start. So definitely recommended. The 10 litre Clark tank, while not super necessary and I haven't really found myself using like all of the fuel in it on any ride, but it's nice to have that extra capacity just in case, you know, I go on like a long distance ride or it's just like a little bit extra insurance. The last thing I wanna be doing is running out of fuel and having to push the bike back to the car. I actually uh, mid ride lost one of the bolts from the foldable levers that were in here. Uh, not that I really need foldable levers cause I've got the wraparound bark busters, but one of the bolts uh, actually went missing on the brake side, so I've had to go back to the stock brake lever, which I actually like the feel of the stock brake lever a lot more. These don't feel as nice as the, the stock. The stock's got you know a bit more smooth edges and just feels a lot nicer. Some of the main comments I get when people ride this bike are about the brakes and how well they work, and I think that's mainly attributed to the braided brake lines. So a lot of people get on my bike and they'll hit the back brake or hit the front brake and kind of comment on how fast it stops or how responsive it is. And it's gotta be just because of those brake lines. And I do love them because I don't have to push that foot pedal too far before it actually starts doing something. On some bikes I get on and ride, you gotta really stomp on that to kind of get any reaction out of the back brake. Bar pad mounted phone holder was great until I decided to mount my phone in the vertical position one day as I was navigating back to the car and the fork's compressed and the brake cable come 
up and wrapped around the phone and the phone case and pulled it straight out of the phone case. The phone case stayed on the, the holder, but the phone actually fell out. Completely my fault. I didn't even think about the brake line coming up when the force compressed and I lost my phone for two or three hours and had to use Find My iPhone. It was just a nightmare, but I did find it in the end and uh, lesson learned. These Dunlop Geomax AT81s have the same amount of hours. These are the, the original tires that I built the bike with. So these have got 47 hours on them as well. And they're well due for being replaced. I've actually, I flipped them at about 20 hours and I probably should have replaced them at around 35 to 40 hours, but I've been a little bit lazy. But these tires have been super great. Couldn't be happy with the grip. I actually got them recommended to me by someone who's been riding for a lot longer than I have. And I'm sure they've tested way more tires than I ever could. It was a lot easier to ask them what their favorite tire was than try and find out for myself because they ride a lot of the same terrain I do anyway. I check the valve clearances about every five to six hours since I built this bike and they've been within spec every single time, which is pretty good considering I uh, lapped them at home on my workbench. Um, and as for the top end, that's the same uh, piston and rings and the manual says to replace the piston and rings every 15 hours or so in race conditions but considering I'm not racing the bike spends most of its time in the uh, lower end of its RPM range so I'm kind of stretching that out until I decide that it's a bit low on power or it's a bit hard to start and then I you know I'll, I'll look into it I'll do a compression test but it feels exactly the same as the day I built it and I think I can get a lot more hours out of it considering it's a an expensive aftermarket piston and rings and not just the stock Honda piece. If anyone has any questions about the bike or what I've done to it, let me know in the comments and I'll answer every question I get. But for now, I'll show you guys what I'm gonna change, which is the main thing I wanted to talk about. I managed to pick up this FMF uh, PowerCore 4 off Facebook Marketplace for $250, which is less than half price of what these things cost brand new. I think these things cost like $700 brand new, which is crazy. But this is gonna convert the dual CRF exhaust to a single-sided exhaust, which saved me about almost one and a half kilos. So I'll set up the tripod and put this new bad boy on. It sounds that much different, but it's a little bit deeper and it's definitely louder. I kind of did it just to save the weight. As you can see, like that plus that is a bit of extra material than just a nice single one. I know a lot of the uh, Honda CRF guys are probably cringing right now because I've gotten rid of uh, one of their favorite things, which is the dual exhausts, which makes uh, CRF super noticeable from a distance. You can just see that twin exhaust and you know exactly what you're looking at. Uh, UFO plastics do make like a, a side panel that gets rid of this uh, big one and sort of makes it more a standard sort of flat style like most other bikes would have. Um, I think they only come in white though, so I don't think I would uh, switch that one out. It doesn't look that bad from the back. It looks kind of just pretty normal. out on the clutch cover to turn the crank so I can get the engine at top dead center so I can check the valve clearances. Just confirming top dead center with the cam sprocket according to the head. You can see those, you can see those two lines on the cam sprocket line up with the head. That means it's a top dead center. And there should be a mark on the flywheel, which is right there. You can see through that hole that lines up with that mark. And that way we know we're at top dead center, so we can check the valve clearances. So I'll check the exhaust valve clearance, and that is, as if I can point to it with the feeler gauge, that is between this cam rocker and the top of that valve there. So I'll check that first, and that has to be within 0.25 and 0.31 millimeters. So the exhaust side is checked out. Those shims are still in spec and that's actually the valves that I lap and the intake ones are the ones I didn't. So it's surprising that those are still, still in spec even though I did like a, basically a home job on the valves instead of taking to a machine shop. Now the intake valves have to be between 
0.9 and 0.15 millimeters. These ones are kind of difficult to get at. They need to be stuck under the uh, intake cam lobes. Interestingly enough, the intake and exhaust valves are all in spec, even after uh, 47 hours with no valve shimming needed to be done. I'm not replacing the oil filter in this service because I did it last service and I think you can do the oil filter every 15 hours according to the service manual and I probably only did it like five hours ago so what I will do is just pull it out and make sure it doesn't have anything crazy in it like metal shavings or anything like that so I'll just inspect it. No metal shavings, nothing crazy going on which is what we like to see. And that's it. Next video, I'm gonna strap the GoPro to my helmet and ride some local singles so you can finally see this thing in action. If you wanna see some shorter riding clips, make sure to follow my Instagram at Jack Kelly Builds and to stay up to date with all these videos and build progress and maybe some new builds in the future, subscribe to the channel. Thanks guys, see you next video.